Okay. Um, is this okay in terms of sound? Okay, great, thank you. Um, early modern anatomy books were not just collector's items, but they also played an important role in the transmission and circulation of knowledge, and in research and teaching. However, the focus of bibliographic research thus far has been mostly on large, richly illustrated and well-known volumes, such as Vesalius Fabrica, um, Albinus Tabulae, and Hunter's Anatomia. Okay. Move the button. Um, such luxurious atlases of anatomy could only be afforded by a wealthy elite, and thus tells little about the role of, for, of anatomy books in the training and practices of the majority of early modern medical men. For my book project on anatomical model making in the early modern period, I explored how more affordable anatomy books, so up to about octavo size, um, were used to make anatomy by students and medical pr practitioners to perform dissections and create preparations and models of the human body in research and teaching. I did so through an analysis of traces of provenance and use, including annotations and stains, combined with analysis of secondary sources, such as lecture notes and letters. The period is significant here, as in, 15, as in 1653, the first octavo book to contain detailed instructions on how to clean and preserve human bones and entire skeletons that was also translated in the vernacular was published by Michael Leiser, or Leiser um, and in 1858, 58, the first modern anatomical textbook, Gray's Anatomy, which you all might know, might know the title of, um, appeared. This was also the period in which the production of anatomical preparations and models by medical men and artists flourished. Traces of provenance and use in manuscripts and printed books, ranging from ex libris, um, annotations, sketches, and marginalia to stains and wear, are a rich and fascinating source of information on their reception history and on how they were used in research and learning. Studying traces of use in anatomical handbooks that describe techniques to create preparations um, and models gives us insight in the role of books and oral instruction in, um, in the development and transmission of anatomical knowledge. And this, in turn, allows us to understand the role of printed texts in the acquisition of practical skills more generally. And it transforms the research on the history of anatomy. This research thus contributes um, to answering key questions in the history of medicine, which also throw light on the history of the book in a wider context. What counts as knowledge within a spe specific epistemic culture and era? How do classifications and hierarchies of kinds of knowledge change? And what is the role of book staring? Cambridge University Library and Cambridge College Libraries hold one of the most extensive collections of anatomical handbooks from the period 1650 to 1850. Um, one of the most extensive collections in the world. And during a one-day visit back in 2018, I came across a number of fascinating sources containing exactly the kind of annotations and traces of use that I was looking for in Cambridge. And from conversations with, uh, conserva uh, conversations with librarians, I learned that there were relevant and uncatalogued works in the, in the Departmental Library of Physiology and in various college libraries. And I therefore applied for funding from the Bibliographical Society for two two-week research trips to Cambridge. And the funding was granted in early 2020, weeks before the outbreak of COVID. So I was only able to make those trips last summer in 2022. And today I want to tell you a little about uh, what I found there. So the period I studied, 1650 to 1850, saw the publication of a wide variety of anatomical handbooks and atlases in a range of European languages and in Latin. And those atlases, one of which I just showed you, were large volumes in which images are central. They were very expensive. Handbooks varied in size, layout, and contents, and thus also in price. Some were illustrated, others not. Some gave detailed instructions for dissection and preparation. Others focused exclusively on anatomical information proper. By 1830, the German pharmacist, 
chemist and anatomist Georg Friedrich Hildebrand distinguished no less than 11 categories of anatomical literature. And I've listed them for you on the slides. So he mentioned bibliographies and histories of anatomy, works on the art of dissection, anatomical images with explanatory texts, handbooks of systematic anatomy, handbooks of topographic anatomy, such as surgical manuals or works focusing on specific structures or body parts, handbooks of general anatomy, for example, on tissues, um, anatomical works of mixed contents, anatomical dictionaries, descriptions of anatomical cabinets, works of pathological anatomy, and finally, works on comparative anatomy. And for my research, categories uh, two to eight are most relevant because these were most likely to be used in dissection rooms and um, model making um, workshops. Anatomical literature was not divided evenly over those categories. The large expensive atlases, which Hildebrand describes as anatomical images with explan explanatory texts, were fewer in number than cheaper handbooks of systematic, pathological, or comparative anatomy with only a few small plates. Hildebrand listed only 44 works in the first category and 451 in total in the latter. Very few books were devoted exclusively to the process of dissection or model making, but if they were, they tend to be manuals in the literal sense of the word. So these are books so small that they can be held in one hand. Edward Stanley's 1818 Manual of Practical Anatomy for the use of students engaged in dissections and Herbert Mayo's 1825 A Cause of Dissections, for example, are do a day over volumes. Both are written in the imperative, with senses like two incisions are to, are to be made. Um, and for example, Stanley opens his book with the sentence, this work is strictly for the dissection room, so it was really a book that was meant to be used in practice. And the making of preparations and models received even less attention in these books than dissection. If these subjects were discussed, the book in question was usually written by someone who was a professional prosector, and the prosector was a person performing a di dissection during an anatomical lecture. So the professor would be talking and the prosector would be doing the actual dissection. Um, and sometimes these books were written by keepers of anatomical museums, so we would now um, call them collection managers or uh, curators. Some of these men held medical doctorates, but that was not a requirement. Some had a background in a different field, such as pharmacy. And while their knowledge of human anatomy was usually as good as, or possibly even better than, that of trained anatomists and medical doctors, the focus of their work is often decidedly different. This can be, quite, uh, can be seen quite clearly in a French publication held in Cambridge, and that's the Manuel d'Anatomie from 1815 by um, the surgeon, pathologist, and prosector Jean-Nicolas Marjolin. Marjolin was an anatomy assistant and a prosector before he gained a doctorate in medicine, and he had a long career as a surgeon and a pathologist. His Manuel was meant to help his students with dissections, and therefore focuses primarily on dissection and injection methods. It does, however, also contain instructions for creating corrosion castings of veins, a method that results in a very peculiar kind of models. And if you ever went to the Royal College of Surgeons nearby, then you might have seen some of those. The Cambridge copy has an ex libris of William Clark, um, which also states the book has been presented to the library by his son. Clark served as professor of anatomy at the University of Cambridge from 1817 to 1866, during which time he was responsible for the acquisition of an extensive museum of comparative anatomy and laid the foundations for the School of Biological Sciences at Cambridge. His copy of Mayolan's work is clean, except for what looks like an inky thumbprint on page 344 and a ripped page on, uh, on page 547 of the second volume. Well, the last pages of the second volume have not even been cut, so that suggests that those have never really been used. Like Clark's copy of Marjolin, most books kept in libraries, of course, contain no or very few traces of use, as a spotless condition is often a prerequisite for acquisition. 
Moreover, returning library books damaged often incurred a heavy fine, and over the course of the 18th century, borrowing restriction, uh, restrictions were increased. In the sample of anatomical handbooks from um, the period that I studied at Cambridge University Library and college libraries, 11 contained traces of use. So there's very few, actually, because I looked at over 100. Sometimes these are clear indications of provenance, as is the case for Clark's copy of Marjonin. Similarly, Cambridge University Library holds two copies of Thomas Paul's 1790 Anatomical Instructor, with ex libri annotations explaining how the owners adjusted Paul's instructions to fit their own research practice, as well as various stains and fingerprints that might contain clues to the materials that were used in the cre creation of preparations and models. The traces of use in the copies of Paul's book, which gives instructions on how to create anatomical preparations and models, for example by injecting veins and arteries with colored wax, clearly give an idea of how the book was used. A smudge of red pigment on a page that lists recipes for injection waxes, including a red wax, strongly suggests that the book was open on the table when its owner prepared the recipe. Likewise, a manuscript note on how the injection mass should be thrown into the artery first, as it is otherwise impossible to inject the veins properly, in a hand that strongly resembles that in the letters written by the person whose ex libris is in the book, is a clear indication that he used the book to make his own injected preparations. But traces like these are the exception rather than the rule. Very often, if there are traces of use, they're very minor. And as we see in Clark's copy of Marjolin, marks say very little about how a book was actually used or suggest very light us the usage. For example, there's a strip of paper as a bookmark, an accidental inky fingerprint or a ripped page. Others clearly show the period in which, in which a book was used, and quite frequently that turns out to be much later than the book was actually published. Examples are um, a marginal note in pencil in a 17th century book, um, referencing um, from 1960 in an otherwise pristine copy of a book from 1793, a paper strip with writing in ballpoint pen used as a bookmark in a book from 1832 and a librarian's note on a 1873 flyleaf that says that the book was largely uncut until the 1960s. Of course, clear traces of use combined with clear provenance are the most interesting for my research. But books, especially large and or illustrated books, were often so expensive and therefore something to be cherished rather than soiled with notes and stains. Sometimes the only evidence that a book was actually used by the owner are manuscript corrections or type of, type of typographical errors. And I found a very interesting example of that in a 1653 edition of Lyser's Culture Anatomicus. And it's, it's a weird picture because I tried to photograph the glitter in the ink. <laughs> I don't know if you can see it there in the middle. Um, this is held at the Royal College of Surgeons. Um, and here the owner has used um, ink to carefully correct all the errors in printing. And that shimmer that you see there, the glitter, is caused by minuscule particles of mica minerals, metal or glass, and that was um, added to drying sand, not only for practical, but also for aesthetic purposes. So what can we conclude about the use of anatomical handbooks in practice from um, analysis of traces of use, even though there are few? Most early modern handbooks on dissection, now kept in library collections, contain very few contemporary traces of use. But if they do contain such traces, they tend to indicate use in a study or a classroom rather than in the dissection room or a workshop. Um, things like handwritten corrections and inky fingerprints um, are examples of that. This, of course, does not, does not necessarily mean that they were not used in dissection rooms. Their nearly pristine state may simply reflect a library's acquisition or acceptance policy. However, it is significant, I think, that early modern handbooks on preparation and model making in the same or similar library collections do contain contemporary traces of use that strongly suggest that they were actively consulted while their owners made anatomical preparations or models, 
such as those pigment stains in Paul's uh, handbook and the handwritten comments on recipes and procedures, because I also came across those in other copies of um, Paul's and similar books in other collections. So this suggests that the role of anatomical handbooks in practice was bigger in the making of preparations and models than in dissections. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you very much for that. So now we will move on to Molly Yarn. So Molly Yarn is the author of Shakespeare's Lady Editors, a new history of the Shakespearean text, which Shakespeare Quarterly called one of the best books published on Shakespeare in the last decade. She is currently working on a second book about women printers during the English Civil Wars and Interregnum, for which she has been awarded fellowships by the, by the Beinecke Houghton and Newbury Libraries, as well as two Catherine Panzer Fellowships, one from the Bibliographical Society of America and one from the Bibliographical Society. And she will speak to us tonight uh, on invisible furniture, women printers in the London book trade. Molly. Give me just a second to find my slideshow. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I just want to give the, the sort of caveat that this is all research that I've done in the past seven weeks on this fellowship project. I've been here doing archival research, so thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to do that. Um, all right. On a Thursday in April of 1646, a stranger entered Robert Bostock's bookshop in St. Paul's Churchyard, carrying a sheaf of handwritten papers. This was not in itself unusual, and even the man's insistence that the pamphlet be printed quickly would not have raised too many eyebrows in those days when the presses churned constantly to keep the public up to date on the doings of king and parliament, as well as everyone and their butchers' opinions on those doings. So Martha Bostock, the stationer's wife, knew what to do. She split the manuscript into sections and set out on a well-trodden path stopping at Moses and Jane Bell's printing house in Christchurch, Newgate, Anne Griffin's place in Elliot's Court off the Old Bailey, and Ruth Wayworth's printing house across the street from the looming bulk of Baynard's Castle on the Thames. Each printer received a section on which their compositors set to work. Within a few days, the publication had hit the streets, and Robert Bostock found himself hauled in before various committees to account for its unauthorized publication. But this isn't Robert Bostock's story. Instead, I'm here to talk about Anne Griffin, Ruth Rayworth, and the dozens of other women who ran printing houses in London during the 16th and 17th centuries. Admittedly, I'm simplifying the Bostock story a bit, as there is a contradictory version, but that visual of a woman stationer distributing a manuscript to multiple women printers speaks to the still underexplored practical roles women played in the creation of early modern English books. Kate Coker has described women in the book trade as the unseen leads and furniture that keep text blocks properly spaced and in place. They kept the work in place and were responsible for the smooth operation of various machineries of production, she writes. The desire for concrete evidence leads us to focus on women whose names appear on imprints, but this elides the majority of women involved in the book trade. Women who worked alongside their husbands, but whose husbands outlived them. Women booksellers, hawkers, and mercuries who never registered titles, who may not even have been affiliated with the company. Women bookbinders who had no way to sign their work. Although I'll move, mostly be talking today about women who did appear on imprints, I ultimately hope that we might reorient our thinking about those less visible book women. And visibility is a key word here, both theoretically, as in Kate's construction, and literally. In a literal sense, there are no known surviving images of an English woman printer or even of an English printing house before the 18th century. This speaks to a broader gap in the visual record caused by trends in English art. During the 16th and 17th centuries in the Low Countries, Dutch and Flemish painters experimented with art depicting scenes of everyday life, now called genre painting. Artists like Bruegel, Vermeer, and Rembrandt, along with many less familiar names, produced sens rich, sensitive, and sentimental portraits of working and middle-class people, including women and their surroundings. 
These provide us with invaluable information about life and work during the period, including the work of printing houses. In England, however, genre painting did not achieve this level of popularity until the 18th century. Portraits of royals and nobles represent the most memorable, recognizable English art of the 16th and 17th centuries. And as a result, we lack a visual vocabulary for the everyday lives of non-elite people of the period, particularly women. It's easy to picture Queen Elizabeth, but what about a London woman who owned a brewery or worked in a pewterer's shop? Woodcuts can offer clues, but their cruder style and frequently satirical or comical bent make them less concretely useful as sources of historical details about domestic spaces and women's lives than the exquisitely meticulous realism of the Lowcountry artists. As a literary scholar, I can tell you with complete confidence that visual sources are not the be-all, end-all in this regard, but they certainly don't hurt, and their absence has not helped to combat male historians' tendency to elide, minimize, or ignore women's experiences when writing about the period. Logically, both female family members and unrelated women provided an enormous amount of work supporting the operation of printing houses that has been largely unexamined and unaccounted for. This is the invisible labor that undergirds the actual practices of printing. Outside of the upper class, most early modern English women did not marry until their mid-twenties, and they weren't just waiting in their parents' houses until that happened. Instead, they worked in a relative's business or as domestic servants or apprentices. Laura Gowing has demonstrated that the number of girls either officially or unofficially apprenticed in London companies during the first half of the 17th century has been severely underestimated. The first official female apprentice does not appear in the stationer's company records until 1666, but there are tantalizing hints there and elsewhere that the record is incomplete in this regard. In 1638, a woman referred to as Mrs. White was fined by the company for not being turned over. Turnover referred to officially notifying the company that an apprentice had been turned over from one master to another, often due to the original master's death. The phrasing of the fine, therefore, suggests that Mrs. White was herself the apprentice in question rather than one of the masters involved. And maybe this is just a clerical error, but maybe not. And these women were not siloed off from the book trade activities of their employers or family members. The domestic and commercial areas of the house were interconnected, permeable spaces. Throughout the day, members of the household would have moved between them regularly. Evidence of this can be found, for example, in Richard Smythe's obituary. Smythe was a 17th century London book collector who, for reasons of his own, decided to record the deaths of every person he knew. I suspect he would appreciate the pursuits that we undertake in this group. As a book collector, he was well acquainted with London stationers, so it's no surprise that his list includes the deaths of 138 people connected to the book trade. But this number does not just represent the stationers themselves. There are 20 obituaries of stationers' wives and seven of their children. Even more include references to members of stationers' families, detailing family relationships, marriages, and even behavior. One journeyman, Smith claimed, was a good servant, but a bad husband. One bookseller's widow had remarried, and she and her new husband, another bookseller, live happily in her house in Little Britain. Andrew Crook's wife was a good woman, bookseller Samuel Thompson a good husband. These comments indicate a familiarity with not just the stationer, but with his wife and children and their family dynamics. The early modern shop was an open space, often directly connected to the family's domestic areas, with spillover between the public and private areas. Women and children worked in the shop or passed through it to access other parts of the house, providing plenty of opportunities to interact with customers. The only known early modern image of a printing house that includes an adult woman depicts her entering through a doorway carrying beverages for the workers. But if we start looking less literally for women's bodies than for traces of women's activities, the visual record becomes much richer. This is not to say that women's sole contribution to printing was providing a constant supply of food and drink, as these images might suggest, Far from it, but thinking in these terms has led me to become obsessed with space, specifically the space and layout of English printing houses. And while printing house can be a slippery term in the early modern period, I'm using it mostly today to refer to the physical premises of a printing operation. As I said, unfortunately, as far as I know, there are no extant contemporary images of early modern English printing houses. The images we do have all depict continental printing houses, which were similar but not identical to their English equivalents. 
Moreover, the realities of London properties required each printer to adapt to the space available, making generalizations risky. Overall, this makes it difficult to visualize both the working space of a specific printing house and how it sat within the wider dwelling. But I'm nothing if not obsessively persistent, so I've been assembling information from various sources to elucidate English printing spaces in general and the printing house of Adam and Susan Islip in particular. It's the Islips because Susan Islip is one of the five women I'm mostly focused on for the book that I'm currently writing. To the best of my knowledge, the specific location of the Islip printing house has not been discussed in any published work, and it was never included in an imprint. But according to a later lawsuit, at the time of Adam's death in 1639, the Islips held, quote, a dwelling house together with the printing house and little brick house near adjoining on Giltspur Street in Pie Corner. Pie Corner marked the southernmost point of Smithfield Market, one of the city's oldest commercial areas. Now this, uh, I will say, is a hand-drawn map that I have been using as part of this process, and uh, we'll zoom in here on Smithfield, and of course I need to redraw the whole thing after this archival trip because I have completely, completely rewritten it in my head. Uh, but just to have a little extra visual of where we're talking about. Since the 10th century, Smithfield had been the site of a meat market. Cows, oxen, sheep, pigs, horses, and other livestock were sold and traded there, helping to explain the names of streets that emptied into its broad expanse, which included Cow Lane, Chick Lane, and Duck Lane. Enormous pens housed animals waiting for sale and or slaughter, meaning that an ever-present barnyard cacophony comprised part of Smithfield's soundscape. With the sound came the smell, an overwhelming thug of animal urine and feces, leavened with food odors, wafting from the area's numerous cookshops, inns, and breweries. Given that printed houses, printing houses used vats of urine and lye themselves, Susan and Adam may have been nose blind to these other smells at this point. On a particularly eventful day, Smithfield could be hosting the famous Bartholomew Fair. On a more gruesome occasion, it could be the site of an execution. Things that were regularly burned at Smithfield included religious martyrs like Anna Skew, as depicted here, women who killed their husbands, and seditious books. When Adam Islip died, he left a brief but slightly muddled will. For our purposes, uh, it included two important bequests. He left everything to his wife Susan during her lifetime, minus some personal monetary bequests. In a codicil, however, he noted that after Susan's death, his former apprentice, Richard Heron, who already lived on site and was probably his overseer, should receive all of Adam's printing equipment, an addition that would later become a point of great contention. When Susan inherited the printing house, she was almost 80 years old. Depending on who you ask, either Susan begged Richard to consider continue living in the printing house and running the business, or Susan gave in to Richard's importunity and the persuasion of some friends on his behalf and agreed to rent him the printing house. They drew up a contract specifying the terms of their deal and the rooms that Richard would be allowed to use. They renegotiated the, the lease several years later, expanding Richard's space in the property. My first glimpse into the house's layout came through these lease agreements, as quoted in a later lawsuit. And here I've, I've excerpted uh, specific descriptions of the room uh, the rooms. Some particularly interesting points, I think, are the warehouse or bruising room, which I think is meant to be red brushing room, uh, as well as the chamber uh, where the Turkish history uh, now lies, which once he sells those extra copies that have been lying around, he will have access to that room. Uh, I've since supplemented the, uh, the information during this trip with details from other lawsuits, leases, and other archival documents. Based on the accumulated evidence, I suspect that the Islip property consisted of at least three separate leases. Since around 1615, Adam and Susan had leased the former King's Head Inn in Pie Corner from Joan Halton and her heirs. A 1647 lawsuit provides detailed information on the dimensions and orientation of the various rooms, and based on that, I have come up with this possible plan of the house's layout. We also know that during the 1620s and 30s, Adam leased two shops with adjoining houses to a leather seller and a saddler. These may have been carved out of the space covered by the King's Head Inn lease, but may also have been covered by a but then part of a separate, still unknown lease to an adjoining property, and I lean towards the latter possibility. And finally, from Christ's Hospital, 
they rented a garden plot in the town ditch directly abutting the city wall and the northwestern bastion on which they built the new little brick house referenced in one lawsuit. And as you can see, that rounded thing on the corner there is in fact uh, the bulwark or bastion right there on the corner and that green shows not the size but the positioning anyway of the plot that they leased. As you can see, I have a lot of evidence about these properties, but limited specifics about how the printing houses functioned within the property as a whole. I have the opposite problem with this other example. I was thrilled to find not one, but two descriptions of Elizabeth Perslow's printing house at the east end of Christ Church Newgate in the Christ Hospital View Book. Here I have plenty of information about the distribution of working spaces throughout the property, but much less than I'd like about the dimensions and layout of the rooms. Uh, here's a transcript of, of those documents. Uh, it's very interesting. It's fascinating. You can see on the second story, uh, there's the first printing room, a warehouse uh, leased, I believe, from Perslope by Mr. Bourne, who's presumably Nicholas Bourne. The second printing house on that story. Then you go up, you find another printing house, uh, another warehouse. The Christ Hospital record, uh, records pinpoint the location of the Perslow House to this area of Christ Church, and I believe it is part of the property depicted in these two plans. The first plan dates between 1630 and 1665, the years that the Poulter's Hall were in this location, and the Poulter's Hall is noted in the corner there. Uh, I lean towards the later end of that range personally. Uh, the London Metropolitan Archive, which holds uh, these plans, dates the second plan to 1678. Unfortunately, the view book that would probably confirm these dates and identify the lessees is not accessible due to condition. But the really interesting thing to me about both of these plans is that the same space in both is linked to printing. On the earlier plan, the label reads, a great room on the ground now divided into several rooms or warehouses and over this room and the passage several rooms, warehouses, and printing house. And the second simply labels the whole space, the printing room. This continuity over decades speaks to the multi-generational long-term use of these properties and their deep local associations with the book trade. So that's all I have for you here today. Uh, my larger point, of course, is that studying early modern women in the book trade means asking different questions and looking at known facts in a different way. It refuses, a, it refuses to allow us to abstract the production of the material text from the physical embodiment and experience of its makers. And ultimately, when we make visible the lives of women in the book trade, we also illuminate the spaces around them. Thank you very much, Molly. So now I'd like to introduce Jerry De La Roca de Candel. Jerry was ERC postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Oxford and a member of Christina Dondi's 15th century book trade for five years from 2014. He specializes in early Greek printing. Despite now working in Milan as a bank consultant, he carries on his research and has re recently finished editing with Paolo Sackett and Anthony Grafton, Printing and Misprinting a companion to mistakes and in-house corrections in Renaissance Europe, 1450 to 1650. He's also president of the Society for the Preservation of Rare Books, a UK-based charity that organizes emergency conservation projects in small libraries around Europe. And he's speaking tonight on Aldine proof sheets in the 1499 Deascardis. Good afternoon, and um, thank you for hosting me here. Uh, unlike Marike and Molly, I have barely started my research, even though the grant was given some six months ago. In fact, I haven't even um, collected the grant, so probably I should hurry up with that. Uh, I hope by the end of the year, I will, I will make sure I will. Um, I will talk to you about uh, some proof sheets that I found by chance. Uh, in, uh, in the 1499 edition of Dioscorides. Um, and um, let's just briefly consider you know, 
uh, proof sheets. So why are they relevant? Um, they are relevant because, uh, particularly when they contain manuscript corrections, they can provide information, useful information, both on textual transmission and on editorial techniques. Um, they are, there's some debate on how they were, how proof sheets were produced. Um, often, your um, early, early modern printing manuals will claim uh, the existence of three stages of, um, of proofs, uh, but that is not always the case. Uh, and uh, we, we don't have certainty. It could have varied based on different print shops, countries. So um, there's still some degree of um, uncertainty as to um, how proof sheets, kind of the whole, the whole approach to, to proofreading worked. Um, just carrying on with a little bit of subliminal messaging, um, with, um, we, with Paolo Sackett and Anthony Grafton, we recently published uh, Printing and Misprinting. But within this uh, book, there is uh, a very good article by Randall Hertz. Uh, it's called Proof Sheets as Evidence of Early Pre-Publication Procedures, which is particularly useful because it also contains the most updated bibliography on proof, re on, on proof sheets. Um, in Hertz's um, study, um, I mean, Hertz counts about 25 surviving proof sheets with, cor with corrections um, against hundreds that survive without corrections. Now, of course, um, as interesting as they may be, it is clear that when they contain corrections, they, they say more. Uh, this applies to the German-speaking regions, so it includes um, um, books produced oh, kind of in, in I assume, Germany, Austria, um, Switzerland. Um, it's harder to tell for other regions, but with regards to the 15th century, I think we can probably be um, hopeful that you know, maybe uh, some 100 uh, survive, perhaps less. Um, many still are to be found because um, until recently, um, the vast majority of proof sheets that have been uh, discovered come from bindings, either used as waste material or as, well, technically still waste material, but as um, paste downs. Um, the proof sheets that I've found are unusual in that they are interspersed in the copies of um, the uh, of, of the Dioscorides editions. They have another couple of elements that are, are unusual, but I first I'll get at um, how I ended up finding them, and that is it's also related to this book because um, in in it that I the, the article I worked on I mean actually started off with uh, an article published for the library on the Salterion, so on Aldous Manusius Salterion, where it was um, well, where I found that the on top the correction that is repeated over and over in the copies of the Salterion are in Aldous's hand in the vast majority of cases, and there are small numbers of copies with um, 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 stop press corrections and also uh, a small number of corrections with a second hand that has yet to be identified. Uh, it does not match any of the known hands of Aldous's main collaborators. Um, incidentally, that's the only case that I found of 15th century uh, corrections in Aldine editions that are not by Aldous himself. The point is, um, he was a bit of a control freak. Uh, he wanted to control the correction procedure. So these are all corrections that he personally inserted in all of his editions. Um, we know his hand from the Greek from uh, his own grammar that is in the Bibliotheca Ambrosiana. We know his Latin from the, his, his uh, wills. Uh, it's always him um, producing these corrections. So I was looking at, um, well, about, I think in the end, some 1,500 copies of Aldine and Kinabula in all the editions to try and have at least a 10% of each edition uh, covered. And I found many corrections um, post-publication, so to speak. 
but in the Dioscorides, I found something unusual. That is, there are no corrections uh, post-production in the Dioscorides. But uh, in one copy in particular, the one in uh, Leobarden, uh, not really sure how to pronounce it, Leobarden, uh, I'm guessing, something like that, yes, sorry. I <laughs> hope you're not listening. Um, the, a completely clean copy, and all of a sudden, um, uh, a page with four or five major correct, four or five corrections of minimal things, but written very big, which I'll now show you. Um, and it was unusual for a number of reasons, so I'll, I'll get there. But just to give you a sense of uh, what we're looking at, the Dioscorides survives at relatively low numbers for for Aldine and Cunabula. Um, 116 known copies, probably there'll be a few more, but these are, this is uh, counting together ISCC and Givi. Um, currently I have inspected 42 and um, I, there will be an, a further 22 inspected thanks to the Libsoc grant. Um, the copy in Leovarden was the first one that I found, and so I started searching more carefully in other digitized copies. Bear in mind, this is work that was being done during COVID, so basically in pyjamas and you know, uh, scrolling through, through digital reproductions of books um, from home. I then, luckily enough, found a second digitized copy, the one in Vienna, with also um, evidence, with an evidence of at least one proof sheet being bound within the book, and later on, Back out into you know into the wild. I went to the Paris uh, to Paris to the Mazarin, and I found there to uh, proof sheet. So currently, I've found three out of forty-two copies. I haven't since. I have not found other copies, but I am hopeful. Um, the corrections are in Aldous's own hand. Again, I'm almost certain of that. We're looking at small corrections, but the hand is consistent with other corrections he makes in in uh, post production. Corrections, um, and they are particularly useful when it comes to proof sheets because Aldous was not just a printer; he was uh, a very uh, proficient grammarian and, and an editor of classical texts. So, what we are looking here is at the work of someone who is both a printer and a scholar. Um, going back to the stages of proofreading, um, I'm quite sure these. Uh, sheets belong to the last stage, the final stage. We have very minor corrections. Um, and um, like I said, I think uh, a survey of all copies is necessary because if we found three in 40 copies, I am hopeful that perhaps another four or five will be found and could provide more, you know, a broader sense of, of how he approached editing his own books. I'll now show you a first example. I have slightly uh, cut these images to exclude the parts where there are no corrections. And I've marked in, uh, in red the part of the text where uh, a correction is to be inserted, and in green the, uh, the correction to the side. Um, and you, this is the first one I found. And if you imagine just finding a, you know, a book entirely with you know, not a single margin, you know, marginal note, and then all of a sudden all these notes on one page you know, begs a couple of questions. Uh, a couple, of, yes. And um, I'll show you some other examples. Well, I'll show you all the examples. Uh, this is the, sorry, that was uh, two recto, and this is seven versa, so it's um, kind of in a sheet. It's the two sides of the same sheet. Um, but interestingly, um, in the, this is the beginning of, uh, of uh, Nicander, but still part of the same edition of Dioscorides. So this is uh, capital delta six recto. Again, you have corrections in this case, both in the main text and in the commentary. Um, and this is six recto, and this is six verso. There are no corrections on the uh, conjugate leaves, which would be, I think, three, uh, so delta three. And likewise, in the Leovarden copy, there are no corrections on the other side of the sheet. So the pages have been printed. When I was saying that frequently you would find proof sheets used as paste downs because they would only be on one side. So you, the, the, the blank side would be used as the you know, on to the scene on, 
and the printed side would be glued to the, to the paper. So there's something unusual about these proof sheets, um, both because they are they appear uh, consistently, and then I'll show you also in the third copy, only on two out of four pages. It could be that there were no corrections on the other, the other two, but it seems a little odd. And because they were printed on both sides, let alone the fact that they ended up in the books, and I still do not know why. And it's the only case of having seen by now quite a few of Aldous's in Cunabula, it's the only case. I think I would have found others by now had if they were around. Um, one of the problems of uh, identifying uh, these these proof sheets is that, for instance, I'm, this is a copy I saw recently at the University Library of Vienna. Copies sometimes are heavily annotated, and of course, there's a lot of noise. That's kind of a problem. There's a lot of noise, and sometimes it's hard, you know, flipping through the pages to uh, separate what are annotations by one or more readers and what are actually uh, Aldous's corrections. And I'm, I'm showing this image because one such example happened in the uh, the Mazarin copy, where there's an overlap. And of course, you know, now this is a blown up image with colors, but when you're going through many pages with annotations and so on, it's easy to just miss. So this I almost did not see, but then kind of something, again, I think stood up with two different hands, one larger, and I then realized that actually this was you know, a copy of a proof sheet that had then been read by someone and annotated by someone, and you'll find the same on the verso um, with, with annotations, and there are other annotations above and below, which I am not showing here. Uh, again, in this case, too, we're looking at uh, Ita, Seven, Recto, and uh, Two, Verso, Two, Recto. I must have missed, made a mistake there, but anyway, it's um, uh, two sides of, it's the same side of, of one sheet. Um, here I'm showing, just to give you a sense of the corrections, how, um, the corrections appear. So, so the sorry. To the left, you have a proof sheet. To the right, you have a properly printed copy uh, from the digitized copy from Munich BSB, and I've um, magnified or increased the size of the two examples where you can see the um, proof sheet and the actual correction as it appears in all other copies. Um, and and it, so the conf confirmation that they are proof sheets comes from the fact that all of the copies have a slightly you know have a different um, appear differently. Um, I think this also begs a few questions about the notion of what you know states of printing because does that count as you know a pre state of, of printing? I, I'm not sure, but I'm not going into this. Um, I'll just uh, finish. Um, I'm showing just. Um, the, these are the, the corrections that I've currently identified, and to simplify the matters, I've just uh, I'm just describing the types of corrections. So mostly it's very small stuff uh, in correct punctuation, missing uh, an incorrect letter or a missing letter or a letter too much, sometimes swapped. The one that I find interesting is the iotacism, so the tendency of uh, kind of modern Greek, I mean, to pronounce letters differently from how they were pronounced. Uh, in uh, in classical times, which results in, uh, for instance, eta or eta uh, being um, replaced by uh, iota because it was read as uh, so the sound was e, and which means that a Greek compositor would have kind of cognitively uh, thought of an iota more frequently than uh, an eta. So sometimes it happened that they would replace uh, the two letters. So. Um, and for the rest, it's, it's incorrect accents, missing accents. Um, one interesting thing is that still these texts contain lots of mistakes. Um, Aldous was far from, from perfect. He, he made an effort, but he was far from perfect. So it's, it would be interesting to understand when and why he decided to correct some of these mistakes, and many other times he didn't. Um, this is just to show you a current state of the copies that I have seen to the left, the ones I have inspected, um, and to the, the two columns to the right, the ones that I have not uh, yet inspected. The, the one marks, marked in green are the ones that uh, I will see thanks to the Bibsox contribution. 
Um, I, of course, I was, uh, yesterday I merrily um, went to the British Library uh, looking forward to see, to see a lot of copies and uh, I did not know about what had happened. So uh, I, was, I was turned uh, away and I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that Oxford will give a few more satisfactions. But, um, um, but yes, I will, I will have to come back, which is always a terrible pain and I will. <laughs> so um, yes, now the, the last thing I'd say is that I, there are questions that remain um, such as why did these proof sheets end up uh, in these copies? Well, as far as I know, it's very unusual. Mostly they survive as waste material of sorts. Um, one theory is that they were kept as possible integrantia. So for, you know, um, perhaps if a print run of a certain sheet was short, they had just a couple of corrections, they could use them rather than having to reset a whole sheet. Um, um, another, um, well, and um, that is one option, but if you have any ideas, or in fact, if you know of any other cases of proof sheets with corrections that have ended up in, uh, in the actual books, I'd be happy to learn about them because I, for as far as I know, I'm, I'm not aware of any. And the other question is why only on two uh, pages out of four? It seems, I mean, perhaps when I'll find other proof sheets, if I will, uh, there will be corrections on all four. But it strikes me that three out of three have corrections on only two sides. Um, whether on one, you know, on the side. and so if there are any any ideas as to what this may mean or imply, I'd be very glad to hear suggestions. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much to all of our speakers uh, now. I think we do have a few minutes for questions. And for the online audience, if you have a question, just put it in the chat that is being monitored and it will be asked. So um, I wonder if our speakers might actually come up and join me here um, to answer you know, any questions that we may have. And I invite questions from the audience before I ask my own. Yes, Christian. And can you wait for the microphone so that everyone can hear? Thank you. Hi, three fascinating papers. Thank you very much to all three of you. Um, I have a, a question for Jerry. Um, really wonderful presentation, thank you. Um, I was particularly interested to see your classification of types of correction, um, because that made it clear to me what I tried to see in the images, um, that um, Aldous was correcting um, things which were fairly obvious mistakes in the printing process, as you yourself said, with the possible exception of the ioticism, which of course could be copied from a manuscript. Um, does this give us reason to think about what we mean by proofreading? What do you think Aldous was doing? Um, surely it could either be he was reading through a page and picking out some mistakes which any but he, as competent in Greek as he was, would stumble over and say, surely this is wrong, and correct it? Or do you think that he was correcting, not open Guinea, but against uh, uh, an exemplar from which there had been setting? Is there something you can extrapolate about that? Um, to be honest, I know. I mean, I would not dare at this stage uh, extrapolate. I can, I can make some educated guesses. Uh, the fact that the, these sheets are printed on two sides means something. I mean, it's, uh, you know, in terms, purely typographical terms, uh, it means that they had proceeded with the typesetting of, uh, of these sheets. And so um, it, it seems to me that he was just reading the text um, not against an exemplar. I would also add that having by now the experience, in a, he, when I said he's uh, a control freak, he is a control freak. He does not seem to be able to let 
any of his assistants do a job that they could very well do because some corrections I've seen are moderately complex, but others, I'm not talking of the proof sheets, I'm talking of all the other books. But uh, the, the book that Paolo Sackett studied contains, I think, 26 or 27 manuscript corrections. And you know, if you estimate a uh, print run of, I don't know, 500, 1,000, he made uh, 27,000 corrections. Uh, then he was complaining that he never had time to do anything. Well, you know, uh, it doesn't surprise you. But um, I would say that he was just double, triple correcting um, all the time. Whenever he had time, he would double check and triple check. And uh, this might just be one of those examples of a really kind of last minute check. But the other copies contained those corrections. So clearly, as last minute as it may have been, and if he had to do so many corrections in the printed copy, it means that he went on correcting even after uh, <laughs> he had finished printing. So if anything, we learned something more and more about his character. Um, but I'd like to see a few more proof sheets to get a sense of how he was doing this work. Thank you. Other questions or questions online? I have a couple of questions. I'm going to interject then. Um, um, the first one is for um, Marika, because um, I found it interesting that you didn't find much evidence for any of the printed books being used in the anatomy theater. But I wondered if that was because perhaps they were taking manuscript notes themselves. So have you found manuscript notebooks that would show that? And, and what would that um, teach you? Yes, absolutely. Um, it's a very, very good question indeed. So there are a lot of manuscript notes taken by students, um, especially in anatomy theatres during lectures, um, where they attended the dissection. But what I'm interested in is what they actually did themselves in terms of dissecting and making preparations, which were two separate activities, so to say, um, because... Um, I don't know if you've ever been in an anatomical theater, an early modern anatomical theater, um, but it's, it's actually very hard to see anything um, because there, there's a body in the middle and it's very steep, so people were standing and looking down, um, but unless you had really, really good eyes, you wouldn't be able to see much. So what you see in all the anatomical um, handbooks in the period is that um, the authors say in the introduction, well, actually, you can't learn anatomy from a book, and you also can't learn anatomy just from attending a dissection. You'll actually have to dissect yourself. Um, and this is one of the reasons that a lot of landlords weren't keen on housing medical students, because they would do this in their rooms. So you can imagine <laughs> the smell. Um, and so it is indeed, um, I think, what, what I'm also what I'm trying to do in the book is to reconstruct the, the entire corpus of anatomical practice, um, both for students and um, anatomists. So it consisted of uh, multiple activities, attending lectures, doing dissections yourself, and at some point making preparations and models yourself. So, um, and that's also where uh, collaborations with artists come in. Um, and that's what you see in, for example, Thomas's Paul, uh, Thomas Paul's book very uh, distinctly. Um, at some point he also says, he, because he gives instructions on how to make uh, plaster models, and he says, well, I've, I've gotten you these instructions, but actually if you really want to learn how to do this properly, you're much better off just finding yourself a plaster artist and spending the afternoon with them. It will be much more effective. Thank you very much. And before I continue, I'll ask if anyone else would like to ask a question. Or do we have any online? Yes. Okay, very good. Well, I do have another question. Um, to Molly, I, I find it fascinating that you're kind of documenting the, the space that these are going in, and specifically kind of women's spaces. Um, what can you say about the windows? I have to say there's always been a little bit puzzling, you know, for me, because you sometimes in the images you see these, you know, very big windows for obviously, you know, premises or the rooms rather that are on, you know, somewhat upper stories. But does that actually explain it? I mean, it's very detailed work, you know, this, you know, printing both from the setting, the type, and which may be by touch, but also the... Uh, the proofing and, and everything else. What, what do we know about the windows in the spaces? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. So uh, from Mox and writing later in the century, he suggests that printing houses are oriented east-west to take advantage of the light as much as possible. Um, something that I do know about the Islip house is that it's very likely that it was oriented north-south, which is sort of an interesting question. Um, 
Yeah, the light was very important, and of course the uh, materials that the window would be filled with could be different, which could change things a lot. Uh, there are specific suggestions about how compositors' cases are oriented to the window so that the hand that was being used wouldn't shadow the case. Um, and uh, yeah, so obviously, the, but the light, I think, was probably one of the biggest practical day-to-day -day issues that they would have had to deal with in terms of working with the architecture of whatever building they ended up with. Because of course, yes, you want to maximize uh, your space. And I believe Peter's actually written a little bit about the frontage of one uh, printing house and saying it was very long but more narrow. Um, and that sort of makes sense in terms of getting as much uh, window space in the walls as possible. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Yes, Christian. Wait for the microphone, please. Marie, you read a trivial question. <laughs> um, uh, the, the manual you showed, which had very few signs of use, but a thumb mark. Yeah. Is it not possible that's not a sign of use at all, but a printer's thumb mark? That's, that's actually an interesting question. Um, I would have to analyze the ink to be sure about that. It looks like writing ink rather than printing ink. So I suspect it is a sign of use. Um, however, I, I am collaborating with um, some scholars who do chemical analysis of stains. So hopefully at some point I will be able to. Yes, true. But I mean, for example, the, uh, the stain in Thomas Paul, the red stain um, with the recipes, that's really interesting, of course. I, I would love to know whether that's actually vermilion, like it says in the recipe, or a different pigment. Yeah. I see Robin Hollis. Another question for Jerry, if I may. Um, I'm curious about your closing statements about the uh, reasons for these proof sheets being present in these three copies. But what about the uh, your inspection of the sewing and the binding and whatnot? I I gathered from what you said that you thought that these sheets were introduced at the time of the original gathering, and I'm wondering if they might have been introduced in the copies at later dates. Uh, you mean introduced? No, if you can keep. You mean introduced at a later date, as in when? Well, I mean, uh, uh, copies are always being perfected with uh, additions from other copies, mm. and it could be that these sheets in the discordies, these proof sheets were introduced simply to perfect the copy. Say, many books in, the, in Vienna are in, many of the Aldines in Vienna, as you know, are in 19th, early 19th century bindings when there was a... Sure. Uh, um, well, in fact, the Vienna copy is in a, an original binding that it must be early 16th century. The, the Leovarden copy is interesting because I think in Leovarden they have uh, a slight concentration of Erasmus's books. And so it, there is a chance that that book came, though it does not have the, the usual, you know, sum erasmi, um, though it is true that also that, I think, has been copied uh, free and frequently added in the 19th century to many other books. Um, I think I saw one recently in, in Cambridge, in fact. But um, um, I'm, I don't think they were added at a later stage. Um, it's, it's, it is possible, but certainly the, the Vienna binding is an early 16th century binding. Um, I have not seen the binding of the Leovarden copy, because the digitized, it's a digitized copy, but it's only um, without the binding. And uh, the Paris Mazarin is, uh, yes, it's something yeah, 18th, 19th century. But it, and also, you still would need to find a, the same source of these proof sheets to then perfect, you know, and, and are, these are leaves that I'm at the very middle of a you know, center of a book. It would usually when, you know, perf when they perfect copies, it has to do with uh, first, you, you know, first gathering, second gathering, last one or two gatherings. It's kind of, it's more common. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's harder that you just miss to, to a sheet from the very center of a book, whereas the rest of a book is complete, which is the case with the, these copies. But again, I, I think I really need, I'm hoping to find more to get more of a sense of this because I, I'm puzzled by it. I don't have an answer. It's more a statement than a question. 
on this question of fenestration between uh, 1666 and 1971, the building which was erected at what was simultaneously a five boat court and 38 shoe lanes had the original windows. They were removed in 1973, I think, but they were there until then and they were large. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there other questions or any questions online we should be taking? Very good. Well, I just would like us all to thank our speakers again for and wish them luck on their ongoing research and glad to know that Bibliographical Society has contributed materially to your work. We're very proud of it.